Välkomna nu eh, Robert William Ricks upp på, på scenen. Vi ger honom en eh, varm välkomstapplåd. Okej, okay, good morning everyone. Right, I'm going to talk to you about one of the great luminaries of spiritual learning. That's uh, Emanuel Swedenborg. Um, just for those of you who don't, you're not familiar with Swedenborg, just a very breezy um, introduction. Emanuel Swedenborg a, um, started out as a Swedish scientist, philosopher, um, and had a long career as an inventor and scientist. Um, he was also an overseer of copper mines here in Sweden. Um, he invented things like flying machines. Um, he had several observations on the anatomy of the brain, and only in recent years he's beginning to receive the kind of accolades that he uh, deserves for his um, his, his uh, observations on the brain. But at the age of 56, um, Swedenborg experienced dreams and visions of a spiritual nature, culminating in a spiritual awakening, and um, these these. Dreams and visions are recorded in um, in the spiritual diary, which was as a posthumous uh, publication, um, alongside some fairly racy dreams. Uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, that's a, that's a place to go to. But in terms of his um, his spiritual awakening, he um, believed that he was appointed by the Lord to um, to write a heavenly doctrine to reform Christianity. And the first one of the first books he published uh, was called Arca Arcana um, Celestia and in English translation it fills a bumper 12 volumes so it's quite a, a, a large work and it's basically one long exegesis of uh, the two first books of uh, Genesis in which he expounds the internal sense of the um, creation narrative that is a taint he sees this not as as real historical events, um, very much against the grain at the time, uh, but he sees as a tale of human psychic reintegration with the high understanding of the self and its spiritual potential, and that take on the Bible is something that's very significant for the the reception of um, of Swedenborg. But he was convinced that he had, uh, the Lord had opened his eyes and that he could freely visit heaven and hell and talk with angels and other spirits in the world beyond. Um, now, these are sometimes these, um, these spirit visitations, or rather the, the, um, the visits he makes in the um, spirit world, are sometimes, um, he sometimes describes uh, beautiful vistas, um, beautiful landscapes, as if this was a kind of Claude Lorraine um, landscape painting. At other times, there's quite um, visceral action going on, where he has discussion with, uh, devil, discussions with devils, discussion with angels, and so on. And because of his interest in uh, conversing with spirits in uh, the world hereafter, uh, Immanuel Kant wrote this uh, very famous uh, scathing attack on Swedenborg, a very uncharacteristically polemical uh, work called Dreams of a Spirit Seer, which uh, did much to damage Swedenborg's reputation in academic circles. But if you look at Swedenborg, there's actually a method to how he writes these spirit um, visits. Because if you read his works, he'd usually um, set out a theological doctrine in a fairly sort of dry um, 18th century manner. Um, and then argue a kind of doctrinal um, matter, or some, some kind of um, a theological um, uh, argument. But then he would intersperse that with uh, what he calls memorable relations, in which he visits the spirit world, and he's vindicated in what he just put forward. So he would then converse with angels, and the angels would say, yes, you were right. Um, it's absolutely true what you've said. Uh, we can now, from the spirit world, we can... Um, we can now um, condone this particular um, point. Um, sometimes you'd find that uh, the, these Swedenborgian visions are quite entertaining. Um, I remember one passage in particular where um, he has an, an argument with devils, because that's also one way of convincing the reader that um, he is right in the, what he's put forward. Um, so he has this, this, uh, this uh, heated argument with, uh, with two devils, and one devil gets so angry with him that he throws a book at him, and he ducks and he hits the um, devil behind him, so he, he 
he uh, receives a knock on the head. Um, so that's the kind of thing you get. So very visceral, um, entertaining stuff there. But for the remaining 28 years of his uh, life after the age of 56, um, Swedenborg embarked on a career as a theosophist, writing theological works. And it's really on the back of that that he's, uh, he's um, achieved the reputation he has. He publishes 18 theological works, all in classical Latin. So here we're talking about someone who has impact not in a Nordic language, but in, in Latin, as you, as you would at the time um, as a 18th century philosopher. Swedenborg never attempted himself to set up a dissenting church, um, but others thought otherwise. So some of his followers set up churches almost everywhere in the world. There are Swedenborgian churches in Asia, in Africa, a very strong representation in, in North America. I just recently um, was invited to speak at a, at a Swedenborgian college in Bryn Athen in, in, in um, Pennsylvania. So there's still a lot of um, you know, Swedenborgian churches and communities around the world. Um, just to give you an impression of... Um, the writers, because that's really the meat of the matter here today, the writers who've been inspired by Swedenborg or um, would refer to Swedenborg, um, you see a roster of names here. I'm not going to trot through all of these, obviously, um, but I just want to hasten to add that not all of these are obviously church Swedenborgians. Very few of them are, but in some way they managed to appropriate part of Swedenborg's doctrine or Swedenborg, uh, they use Swedenborg as an inspiration to the work they, they do. Um, just by, may pick a few names here, um, and if we begin in Swedenborg's homeland, um, August Strindberg um, wrote an autobiograph autobiographical novel called Inferno, which came out in French in 1897 which um, Swedenborg sees Swedenborg as the doyen of um, spiritual learning. And he writes about Swedenborg that he was seized, that Strindberg was seized with ecstatic admiration as I listened to the voice of this angelic giant of a previous century. And Swedenborg remained a mental companion for the rest of Strindberg's life. And uh, he was to have a manifold influence on the innovative psychic dramas of uh, Strindberg's later period. There's also D.T. Suzuki, who's not a literary writer as such, but a, um, a Japanese Zen Buddhist scholar. Um, he's the one who applies the um, subriquet, the Buddha of the North, to Swedenborg. So here you have it, a real recognition of Swedenborg's Swedish uh, origin. There's Henry James Sr., the father of, um, of uh, the psychologist William James and uh, Henry James, the writer. Um, so they were both brought up in a Swedenborgian um, household. And a lot can be said about the, um, the influence on their writing. There's Paul Valéry, um, who wrote a foreword to the French translation of Swedenborg's biography, which came out in 1936. Just one other name, sort of the maybe the old one out here is not that famous uh, is James John Garth Wilkinson, who um, actually took another inspiration from Swedenborg, which was the influence of automatic writing, which is where you relinquish all control over your compositional process. And you basically let spirits channel inspiration to you. So he composed a, a volume of poetry written primarily through automatic writing, the same method that Swedenborg had used allegedly to write his, his works. Just to go into a little more detail with just a few of the writers who've been inspired by Swedenborg. Um, Balzac is certainly one. In a letter of 1837, he declares that Swedenborgian, Swedenborgianism is my religion. One of the most Swedenborgian works he writes is Sarah Fitter, um, a seminal work which has influenced um, artists as diverse as uh, Strindberg, as uh, whom I just mentioned, Yeats, and the Austrian composer Arnold Schoenberg. So you might even talk about Swedenborg inspiration at a second remove. Um, so Swedenborg uh, sort of goes through um, Balzac. In uh, Serafita, we have a kind of Swedenborgian figure, a kind of androgynous figure who's, um, who's basically sort of, um, who's just taken up the Swedenborgian philosophy and become a complete, perfect human being. 
Um, but you can also find references to Swedenborg, um, other places in, um, in, in Balzac's works. There's uh, Dostoevsky, who uh, bought and read Swedenborg's Heaven and Hill in a Russian translation. Um, Swedenborgian elements have been identified in Crime and Punishment. Um, and certainly the discourses of uh, Father Zosima in the Brothers Karamazov um, contain a clear, sweet, clear Swedenborgian teaching about the spiritual world, particularly the, um, uh, the impression of hell as a place where you go because you gravitate to it. Because in Swedenborg's philosophy, um, all angels and all devils are basically deceased people, and uh, they're not punished, um, but you rather gravitate towards the kind of place where you belong, um, simply from your mental disposition. Um, Le Fenu, um, Sheridan Le Fenu, the Irish um, horror writer, is another one I should mention here. Um, Swedenborgian influence can be seen in his best-known work, Uncle Silas, but also the wonderful story Green Tea, where um, the main protagonist in, in sort of um, consumes not only green tea, which is toxic, um, but also the kind of toxic learning of Swedenborg, and uh, the, it has uh, you know, catastrophic consequences. There's Borges, um, the Argentine poet, novelist, essayist, and pioneer of magic realism. His interest in Swedenborg is apparent from his essay, testimony to the invisible and even writes a sonnet a very beautiful sonnet actually called Emanuel Swedenborg and um, Borges is just one of the um, literary writers who write essays on Swedenborg uh, W.B. Yeats is another example of of, um, of this tendency but um, where I want to go now is uh, with one of the writers who is certainly very much influenced by Swedenborg, and one of the earliest readers of Swedenborg, that's William Blake. Um, William Blake was um, connected to one of the first Swedenborgian churches in London in Great Eastcheap, and actually attended the first congregation of the, um, of the Swedenborgian church in April 1789. And that's the only uh, religious affiliation we know for certain that um, Blake had at any time in his life. Um, what comes out of this is Songs of Innocence, which was published in 1789. What's interesting about this is that it has so many Swedenborgian allusions. The um, American academic Kathleen Rain once called this the Swedenborgian songs. As a matter of fact, at the time, there was a call for Swedenborgian hymns to be composed because the new, uh, newly established church needed hymns to be sung uh, which had Swedenborgian content. That call was later answered by one of the clergymen in, in the church called Joseph Proud, who wrote 300 hymns. And if you read them, um, there are a lot of you know, overlap between um, what you find in Songs of Innocence and what you find in Prout's uh, collection of hymns. Well, basically you can say about um, the Songs of Innocence that uh, Blake in this collection has no truck with the kind of heavy-handed didacticism you find in other children's poetry at the time. Um, there's certainly no kind of punishment for, um, for children who misbehave, as you find in Isaac Watts and other, um, other children's writers of that ilk. Um, so it's a very liberal collection, and it's one that very much um, does away with any conception of a numinous sky, numinous sky god um, and emphasizes rather the spiritual closeness and inner divinity, which very much harmonizes with Swedenborg's philosophy. Just to put a little um, flesh on the bones for what I'm saying here, just, uh, just want to p uh, point to the divine image, which is one of the central poems in uh, this collection. Um, Just to read from, from um, the very conclusion to that poem. Then every man of every clime that prays in his distress, prays to the human form divine, love, mercy, pity, peace. And all must love the human form in heathen, Turk, or Jew, where mercy, love, and pity dwell, their God is dwelling too. This is very much in line with Swedenborg's Christology. That is the idea that every you know, divine, the, the divine in the universe is basically imminent. It's something that is innate in everyone, and it's communicated through God's um, love and wisdom, 
which is communicated to man through what he calls influx. So he doesn't have a, a concept of a of a very distant sky god. That's certainly not in in um, in Swedenborgian philosophy. So there is certainly a, a reflection on um, of this. There are also other um, places in the Songs of Innocence where you can find a Swedenborgian reference. Um, this is a poem called "The Little Black Boy." Swedenborg had a uh, had a theory that there was a lost tribe in Africa, which they basically preserved the original um, divine teaching. Um, and uh, so for some reason, the Africans were more sort of, they, they, could, they could receive the, the divine um, learning in a better way than, uh, than most Westerners. And this is also what comes out in, in Blake's poem here. As a matter of fact, there's an interesting connection here, as, as uh, Anna's will well know, because we attended the same conference on this. Um, that is that many of the, um, uh, much of the activism that took place uh, around the Swedenborgian milieus at the time um, were um, concerned with slavery at the time. So, um, so some of the, the most significant abolitionists in Britain at the time were Swedes, and they were all Swedenborgians. C.B. Wallström, who's from um, North Shipping, um, came to Britain and became one of the leading abolitionists in, in England. He was a Swedenborgian, so he combined those, those interests, a Swedenborgian, Swedenborgian sort of uh, love of the African with abolitionism. Um, just to stay with Blake for a little while, um, Blake comes out against Swedenborg in a very famous tract, which is the closest thing Blake has to um, writing a manifesto or a, uh, a programmatic statement called The Merits in Heaven and Hell, which is written about around about 1790. In this tract, he announces his decisive break with Swedenborgianism. Um, now, if we read this closely, what he's obviously trying to do is to knock Swedenborg off his perch as one of the fated philosophers of the age. But he's not actually rejecting Swedenborgian philosophy altogether. Um, what he's saying is that Swedenborg is conceited because he believes he's the only one who's told the truth. And he goes further than that and says, well, Swedenborg plagiarizes from Jakob Böhm and others. Um, so he's not that original. But he doesn't actually reject what Swedenborg says. And if you read Blake, um, even after 1790, after the break with Swedenborgianism, there are many Swedenborgian allusions. Um, one of them you can find in this um, illustration here from Robert Blair's The Grave, which Blake illustrated with um, several cuts. Um, and um, what you can see here is basically a scene from heaven where um, the departed... A, a man and a wife meet each other again. They kiss and hug. And uh, one of Swedenborg's very controversial um, ideas was that there was sex in heaven. Uh, quite, it caused quite a stir at the time. Um, so, so there you have it. And um, you know, Blake had a kind of abiding interest in uh, Swedenborg and, and several references to Swedenborg. Now let's go somewhere else um, because um, I want to say a little about um, Swedenborg's legacy. Um, so the question is, why is Swedenborg so important? Why is he taken up so many times by 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 in 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 world literature? Well, first of all, we need to understand about Swedenborg that one of the attractions uh, was that he was a he was very much an Enlightenment philosopher. So we we don't get the kind of mad rantings. Well, yes, he meets spirits in, in the world hereafter. He meets spirits on other planets and this kind of thing. But it's very much his, his cosmology is very much structured. So he's a kind of a spiritual Linnaeus, if you want. He's got taxonomy. He's got um, a kind of systematic approach to uh, how the universe is constructed. And he has this fully um, developed system of correspondences. Now, Correspondences are basically the connection between the spiritual world and the physical world. One example is that he says, well, the, the sun we see in the sky is basically fed by a kind of spiritual source, which is Christ. So there's a connection between the spiritual world and the physical world. Um, and he also has many other examples of how you can read the book of nature, the Liber Naturi. Um, in ways that directly connect with um, the spiritual world. So this is really where the, the crux is of Swedenborgian philosophy, and 
why he has such a, a, a wide appeal to uh, a great many writers. Um, because you have a whole system of correspondences between the spiritual and the physical. And obviously in, in Romanticism, this is a, an important point. You overcome that gap between the spiritual and the physical. One example is uh, Hindmarsh, very early on, 1794, his uh, new dictionary correspondences. You simply see, you can read uh, nature in a new way, um, in terms of, of connecting signified and signified in, in quite a new way. So that's, that's the appeal that Swedenborg has. Just to exemplify this, um, one of the famous places that where this is appropriated is in, uh, in this famous sonnet by Charles Baudelaire from Fleur du Mal. Did you know this? Correspondences. Okay, so I don't need to read it all, but basically what he says here, I'm going to use the English translation, um, apologies for that. Nature, nature is a temple where living pillars uh, let sometimes emerge confound, confused words. Um, and he uses this, uh, this uh, symbol of the forest of symbols. So again, what he addresses here is uh, a way of reading the world in quite an innovative, innovative way. Reading it according to, spir to sp a kind of spiritual philosophy, reading it uh, according to, sp uh, to Swedenborgian correspondences. And this is the same thing we find in, uh, in this example from Blake, and maybe these lines, you know, from, uh, from Augurus of Innocence. To see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So what we get here in both Baudelaire and in Blake is basically a way of collapsing the spiritual and the physical. So rather than having to overcome that gap, um, these are all collapsed here. So it's something innate in the very physical nature that you can then sort of you know, extrapolate from it. And that's, that's one of the appeals um, that we find uh, Swedenborg has. I'm just going to change tack slightly here because um, from Swedenborg's influence on, on literary writers, I want to say a little about how Swedenborg has been rehabilitated in recent years. Um, because rather than relegate Swedenborg to the annals of history, Swedenborg is being reread these days as someone who has something to say about our kind of psychological makeup. Um, this quotation I've taken from uh, Carolyn Blackmer's um, article. Unless the psychological basis of Swedenborg's spiritual world experience is understood, his theology is easily misinterpreted. So here's a reinterpretation of Swedenborg, not as someone who necessarily speaks truth about um, the visits he had to the um, spirit world, but someone who can, s who can um, tell us something about our own psyche and our own um, psychic disintegration. One of the famous readers of the Swedenborg is Carl Jung. And uh, Carl Jung refers to Swedenborg several places. Um, Swedenborg, Swedenborgians are keen to point out that probably um, Jung was very much influenced by Swedenborg. He never sort of officially acknowledges this. Um, but certainly this our whole idea of the theory of the collective unconscious very much reminds us of Swedenborg. The idea of the archetype, these uh, symbols which are basically pervasive, um, throughout history and in, in various cultures is something that Swedenborg also talks about when he talks about correspondences. Uh, it's, a, it's a little hard to sort of make a very uh, firm statement on this because, uh, because I guess both Swedenborg and, um, and Jung, they receive the refracted light of, uh, of Neoplatonism. So the, they both use the same sources. But certainly there's something in, in the way that um, Jung uses Swedenborg and relies on Swedenborg for some of his definitions. And certainly the term um, archetype uh, is used by Swedenborgians in the 18th century. So, um, so there you have it. Um, well, Swedenborg believed that these correspondences were worked into various uh, works of literature. Um, correspondences can be found in uh, the writings of the classical writers. It can be found in Egypt, Syria, Babylonia, Mesopotamia, um, Arabia, the land of Canaan, and so on. Um, and he also talks about a 
angelic language, a kind of perfect language spoken by angels in heaven. And a language that was originally spoken on earth as well, but we've forgotten the uh, meaning and importance of this language. No one speaks this anymore. Um, and that's interesting because um, this idea of the perfect language is something that's been adopted by writers as well. One of the readers of Swedenborg is uh, the American poet Ezra Pound, who reads Swedenborg and says, well, Swedenborg has called a certain thing the angelic language. This angelic language I choose to interpret into artistic utterance. So one could encourage a new reading of the cantos or any other uh, of Ezra Pound's sort of very dense and, and you know, ephemeral works at times from a Swedenborgian point of view, which might be interesting. Um, a stumbling block for many um, or Swedenborg's claim to have undertaken these journeys to heaven and hell. I mean, this seems sort of fairly controversial that he should actually have done so. But there's another way, and this is something I want to address here towards the end of my uh, talk, that is uh, that um, Swedenborg has also been reread of these eyewitness, of allegedly eyewitness accounts of uh, what takes place in the spiritual world, are being reread as literature. So um, we sort of come full circle from Swedenborg inspiring other writers in world literature to actually Swedenborg being read by readers around the world um, as literature. Um, Jung is, again, a, is a very good example that we might uh, pick here. Um, Because Jung um, reads Swedenborg alongside the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and he says this, they basically they say the same thing in a kind of literary language. So he compares the two. Uh, he says they're both statements on the psyche. They're both they're both saying something about our psychic disintegration and the attempt to reintegrate um, in another place beyond this world. Samuel Taylor Coleridge is another one who very early on understood Swedenborg perhaps not as someone who's telling the truth about these um, visits to the other world, um, but someone who thought that you should receive Swedenborg's travels as the account of a series of allegorical in part and in part symbolical visions. So rereading Swedenborg as literature. Walt Whitman in America thought Swedenborg, Swedenborg would make um, the deepest and broadest mark upon the religions of the future, ages here, of any man that ever walked the earth. He reads Swedenborg alongside the, the Edda, alongside uh, other works which have a kind of aesthetic quality to them, but still um, have, have been uh, world religions at one point in time. Um, so you see Swedenborg as someone who provides something which has a literary um, quality, um, at the same time as being something that can really guide us. Um, yes, um, Emerson, um, also in America, saw Swedenborg as a literary writer of spiritual truths. Um, Sweden, uh, Emerson includes um, Swedenborg in his collection of representative men, and uh, he includes him as the mystic, but he also, he's also got other things to say about Swedenborg. Um, he says that, um, that Swedenborg is a, lit is a literary writer of spiritual truths, uh, and after Dante, Shakespeare, and Milton, there came no grand poet until Swedenborg sung the wonders of man's heart in strange prose poems. So again, a rereading of Swedenborg, re rehabilitating Swedenborg, maybe not as someone who's really visited uh, the world hereafter, but as someone who's, who's producing allegories for us to read and for us to take in as something that can change our um, psychic disposition towards something that's better. And basically this idea of comparing um, Swedenborg with Dante is something that the Swedenborgians have done themselves. Um, they, see, they see that what, what you read in Dante very much resembles what you read in Swedenborg, so that uh, Swedenborg's visits to the other world can be compared with what Dante says. And that's, they see that as some kind of you know, uh, proof that Swedenborg was actually actually did travel. Um, so Dante they see as a lesser poet, as a myopic 
poet who, uh, who's not quite the sage that Swedenborg is, but they compare the two. So they also tend to read Swedenborg as someone who produces allegories rather than necessarily the truth. And that's another way of rereading or, or rehabilitating Swedenborg. Um, Borges actually also compares Dante with Swedenborg. Um, and he says, well, Swedenborg told the truth where Dante was a poet. That he actually says in one place. But also in this, uh, in this sonnet I mentioned before, uh, which is simply titles um, Emanuel Swedenborg, he says, Swedenborg, he knew that glory and hell too are in your soul with all their myths. So again, a rereading of Swedenborg as an allegorical writer rather than someone who's, uh, who you know, necessarily traveled to, um, to, to the spirit world. So in that way, um, there's a kind of doubleness to Swedenborg's appeal. Um, on the one hand, he's someone who's inspired writers from, uh, from you know, Henry James to, um, to, to Baudelaire. And now he's being reread as someone who actually writes literature. So I think that's, that's the fascinating appeal uh, of Swedenborg today. Those were the words. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, we, that, that must Did Swedenborg have any international contacts? He had several. I mean, he was one of these um, he was one of these diplomats because that, he also served that function for Sweden. So he travelled around and uh, had many contacts. He lived in London at least twice, um, and um, he probably I shouldn't say this, but he was, he was probably also a spy for the Swedish government. Um, so, so he did have many uh, diplomatic contacts around the world, and uh, as soon as he started writing his theological works, he also um, he also made contacts with uh, various churches and various um, um, theological writers and um, and spiritual um, sages around the world. So he he did have a lot of contact throughout Europe, especially in in Britain and Holland. And uh, his family, uh, where did he come from? Um, he came from a fairly strong Protestant tradition. Um, the, there's a family originally called uh, Svebeck, and his father was a Protestant uh, vicar um, in Sweden. And so he was brought up in a sort of uh, traditional Protestant household. And um, they were quite affluent people. Um, so he was uh, he embarked on a career as a diplomat and as someone who's, who would be an overseer of uh, the copper mines. And that was his original vocation. And uh, it was only he sort of uh, abandoned that uh, when he had these sort of um, these visions, these dreams, uh, which led to his career as a as a theosophist. Only one more question, <laughs> because uh, we, we uh, are running out of time. <coughs> or, or short ones, please. I just wonder if there is any influence of Swedenborg as a scientist, natural scientist, and then he as a prophet of what you have call him. Swedenborg 1 and Swedenborg 2, like Wittgenstein, maybe. <laughs> well, I've, I've, yeah, I've, I've read several articles, and that's something that's uh, being, you know, being published as we speak, I guess. I mean, it's, it's a kind of developing area where you look at Swedenborg, especially what he writes about the brain and the anatomy of the brain. Uh, well, that is, I, I, is not my field, but uh, it's my impression that uh, he did make some observations of some value. Uh, but whether they were influential at the time, I'm not, I don't know. Uh, but certainly he's recognized for what he says about the anatomy of the brain, um, which has some truth to it, apparently. It's, it seems something a little ahead of his time, at least. So the, there was some, some influence. Some of the, um, some of the flying machines, um, I think they, just, they were just drawing board um, sketches. So they never, they never made it. But 
Again, you have to be a little careful when you read this because there's often uh, articles by Sweden Borgian to say, well, this would actually work in real life. Uh, so you have like Da Vinci or uh, this kind of the idea that uh, he did produce something which was viable and could actually work. Uh, I mean, and he also was the, the world's leading metallurgist for decades. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was an extremely strong scientist of his time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Astrid, last question. Yes. Uh, did you write letters? Oops. That's a good conclusion. Did you write letters? Yes, all I have letters. Um, he did write letters. I don't know how much of this has been preserved. Um, quite a few letters, as a matter of fact, have, have been preserved. Um, not as much as you would expect. Uh, what's even interesting, I should have mentioned that, obviously, he writes poetry as well. He writes poetry in Latin. So he has a, a small, uh, but you know, not insignificant, literary production. Uh, and it's interesting to compare some of the symbols he uses in, in his uh, poetic production with what he would later write as a theosophist. But he did write letters, and he did write letters to, to go back to the international connections. Uh, he did write letters to people all over the place. Um, so he, do, he does communicate and correspond with, uh, with uh, other, you know, especially in Denmark and Holland, Britain, Germany, and uh, many places. And, um, and that's something, that, that kind of, the letter correspondences increase as soon as he sort of embarks in his career as a theosophist because then he really gets going and communicates with publishers and so on and, and, uh, and most of the early Swedenborgian, um, early Swedenborgian churches were basically pub publication societies to bring out Swedenborg's works to uh, disseminate it as widely as possible. Let's give Robert a big hand. Welcome to the stage.